I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, good afternoon to the STS-61 post-flight crew press conference. Uh, joining us, of course, is the seven-member crew. And uh, as usual with all of our briefings, the crew will show some slides from the mission as well as uh, some video that was shot or on orbit. And uh, after that, we'll take our usual question and answers from here at JSC and, and check with some of the other NASA centers. With that, I'll turn it over to the commander of the flight, uh, Richard Covey. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, it's really a pleasure for the STS-61 crew to be here today. Uh, a month ago uh, today, we had uh, snugly uh, tucked uh, uh, Hubble into the payload bay of Endeavor, and we're beginning to embark upon uh, uh, the rest of the great adventure that was the Hubble servicing and repair. I'd like to briefly introduce, uh, reintroduce to you the crew members, uh, uh, just so uh, you can recognize them in their coats and ties and, uh, and nice uh, suits. Uh, uh, on my uh, right immediately is, is the pilot uh, and RMS uh, operator, uh, backup RMS operator, uh, Ken Bowersox. I uh, probably re heard him called Sox a lot during the mission. Uh, next to him is Claude Nicolier. Claude's a European Space Agency uh, astronaut that we were really privileged to have on board, uh, uh, served as the RMS operator and also as flight engineer for ascent and entry and other orbiter functions. Uh, next uh, are the uh, the odd couple, and uh, they're called the odd couple because they perform the uh, EVAs 1, 3, and 5, and that's uh, Dr. Story Musgrave, who's also a payload commander, and uh, Dr. Jeff Hoffman. Uh, and last, but uh, certainly not least, are the even couple, performed EVAs 2 and 4, and that's Tom Akers, uh, Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, and Dr. Kathy Thornton. We're going to move right on in to, uh, to our uh, film. The night ascent's pretty spectacular. Uh, you look out the window and it's like a welding torch going off when the SRBs light. Uh, KT got to look out the overhead windows and uh, I think that was pretty spectacular too. It looked like uh, daylight behind us on the pad and, it, and uh, I could follow it for maybe 20 seconds before it, it went into just light, just fire behind us. The, uh, the vibrations and the uh, the roar is uh, pretty much the same as in the daytime. Uh, probably the big difference is up when you get towards SRB SEP. Uh, when the rockets go off to separate those boosters, it really flashes outside the, the windows, and it gives me a, a thrill just seeing that right there. I tried um, to warn these guys. Yeah, Covey warned us, but it was still exciting. Um, the engines worked pretty well, and the next thing you know, we were up on orbit and saw a beautiful sunrise. Because of the altitude of the Hubble Space Telescope, we got to go into a relatively high, uh, inserted into a high orbit. Uh, what we found almost immediately is this orbit uh, allowed us uh, a, a greater views uh, than we had seen before on any of our flights. This was what Houston looked like at night. In fact, you can follow a Gulf Freeway down to the bottom part of the picture. You can see Clear Lake and Texas City and Galveston all in, in there. Um, we never saw the U.S. Uh, in the daytime. We saw it at night, but this shows you uh, some of the view of the lights. If you see New Orleans just going off the <coughs> left side of the screen, at the far top left is Chicago. Uh, center screen is Atlanta. Uh, as we come across here, uh, you can see the lights of Florida and then on up the East Coast. Uh, Post-insertion is a busy time for the crew. Uh, you're adapting to zero G and uh, the spectacular views, uh, but uh, uh, we were able to get everything cleaned up this and, and ready for our, our uh, stay in orbit. It shows the crew members at their different positions and uh, being busy. Claude and, and Jeff and Story and Tom trying to work on our rat's nest of uh, photo TV equipment over in the corner. It's our beautiful payload bay again, just waiting <coughs> for us to go to work out there. Here we're getting ready for the rendezvous. Yeah, before those guys could go to work, we had to get the orbiter up there. And uh, this next sequence will give you a feel just how busy it is during a rendezvous. Um, Covey, Claude, and I were working up front most of the time uh, maneuvering the orbiter, and then Covey moved back to the aft station. Uh, everybody else was busy taking pictures, like with this IMAX camera, shooting a laser out the window getting pictures like that of the telescope. The closer we got, the more excited I got. And, uh, I was pretty impressed when I got my first view out the window, and that's just what it looked like. You can see the blue glow from the Earth below. 
And uh, this is the final approach to the telescope. Cavi uh, uh, was uh, flying the orbiter uh, in a very professional way <coughs> and uh, stabilized the orbiter versus the telescope in uh, such a position that I could uh, grab it. But the remote manipulator system had been already put in the poised for capture position about an hour before the final grapple. And this is the final grapple. We saw the target that I was using in order to position the end effector on the telescope and uh, grab it and rigidize it, and then move it in the aft cargo bay to install it on the flight service structure. We had checked out the suits on flight day two, so we knew we had four good suits going into this. We spent a lot of hours training in the water tank, and we were all excited and ready to go do it for real. Here we are uh, doing it for real on EVA day one. Uh, get up and stuff some breakfast down, and while you're eating breakfast, you start putting electrodes on. Those are biomed electrodes to uh, get the electrocardiogram off. Next thing you do is uh, KT and Tom put you in a suit. There's Jeff inside the suit. Then myself, you check out the suits, and uh, if they're all checked out, uh, depressurize the airlock, go outside. It's an exciting moment when you first <coughs> open the airlock and you look out and there's the entire universe staring you in the face. Well, here I am coming out, the first EVA, um, grabbing onto the manipulator arm while Story is coming out now and I took a whole bunch of tools on the arm and the arm is now under Claude's skillful guidance carrying me over to uh, where I'll get the <coughs> manipulator foot restraint which will then remain attached to the arm. We should tell you some of these uh, EVA shots are actually speeded up two or even four times because uh, things move pretty slowly. Uh, this gives you the basic idea of how we work. One person on the arm, one person moving, helping free floating. Uh, the first task, the, uh, the gyros inside the, the bay here, I'm opening the doors and the uh, story's coming up and uh, we're ready to go. And Jeff positions me very carefully inside and puts my feet inside the, the portable foot restraints. And here we're, as we talked about earlier, changing out uh, four out of the eight gyros. Here we're working on the doors. As you recall, during the flight, we had a difficult time closing the doors. So with Jeff on the central handle, myself on a come along, we were able to position the doors and then work the striker plates and get them closed. And that was something we didn't expect. <coughs> And uh, here's myself getting us uh, a leg up on the solar ray change up for the next day. I'm just uh, undoing various bolts there so when Tom and KT come along, they won't have quite as much work to do on EVA day number two. And while Story was doing this, I was working on the fuses. It was pretty spectacular working. You can see right underneath the, uh, the solar array there uh, that uh, this is a view from the elbow camera looking down from the top of the solar array. We replaced uh, a whole bunch of fuses. The solar rays were slewed to the XY plane to prepare for retraction after the end of that EVA. Uh, you can see the one on the left is the one that we expected to behave well, and it did. This uh, footage is also sped up a little bit. It took several minutes for this slew to occur. I spent most of this time when it was happening down in the uh, mid-deck in the airlock cleaning up suits and getting ready for the next day, but I did pop my head up every now and then to watch the retraction so we'd know what was going to happen for tomorrow. This is the good solar array, the plus B2 array, which retracted normally. The by stems are being pulled up in the cassette and the blankets rolling smoothly on the drum. And this is where we wanted them both to work. Uh, the other one, we could tell by a kink in the bi-stem, it was unlikely that that was going to be pulled up in the cassette, that we would have to leave this thing partially deployed. The retraction is ground commanded. However, we do have a stop command on board, and we did exercise it when this one was retracting. When the blanket began to get a little bit slack, it seemed like the prudent thing to do was to stop the retraction at that point and uh, let us take care of it by hand when we got out there the next day. This is the kinked bi-stem. The by stem is two pieces of metal that are flat when they're in the cassette, and when they're released from the cassette, roll up into tubes, one around the other. And it appeared that one of those tubes was eight or ten inches longer than the other, so it made some loops in the, in the, the uh, by stem. Story and Jeff were our IVs. They put uh, me and Tom in the suits, as we had done for them the day before, and sent us out to do our work. As I said earlier, this um, jettison had to be done at 
uh, the disconnecting of the electrical connections had to be done at night because with the solar array still deployed, it is still producing electricity when the sun is on it. So Tom had to cut some lock wire and take some <coughs> connectors off and, and uh, open the clamp while I was holding it because the solar array tended to flap and move around a lot anytime anybody was touching it. Uh, I held it up there and let it go at, with no rates on it at all. It was very, very stable. Claude pulled me back away from it. And then Sox did the separation maneuver that, that uh, pushed us away from it. And you can see some of it's the jet fire. The solar array <coughs> begins flapping and it looked like a giant bird giant soaring bird over the desert. It was just the most incredible sight. I was mesmerized for a period of time just watching it. And there's not much more you can say about it. It's just fabulous. You see the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. I mean, it's you know, one spectacular sight. On the um, solar array that retracted properly, it, they were not unable to stow it by ground command because it wasn't slewed in the right direction. The latches were not going to mate when it came up to the top. So we did that manually as well. Tom was driving up with a wrench, although it was actually <coughs> coasting on its own pretty much. And I went up to the top to be sure that I had my hand on it when it got close to the telescope so we didn't uh, do any damage by slamming it in. We removed that one, put it on the solar array carrier. It's been brought back to Earth for people to study and see what life is like in orbit three years of orbit for solar arrays and what we can do to future solar arrays to make them better. This was our first mass handling exercise. It weighs between three and 400 pounds and it moves as if it's nothing. Just put your hand on it and, and pretty much the, just the natural forces in the suit cause your hands to want to be in a semi-closed position and that's all it takes to hang on to it. I held it in place while Tom closed the clamp to mechanically connect it to the telescope, and then I came down to help with the electrical connection. The connectors are driven in place by one drive screw, and we were very, very concerned about stripping that screw because it had happened other in ground testing at times. So we opted to drive that by hand very, very gently so that we would feel if there were any kind of torques that we weren't expecting, we could back off and try it again. After each EVA, we had to go through, it was really about a three-hour process to uh, clean up the old suits, pack them up for the night, get the new suits out before we're ready to go. And here we are on the third EVA. We talked about uh, the use of these uh, searchlight from inside. This is a good example of what it was like working at night, and the people inside would shine the light to augment our helmet lights. And here I am putting uh, the guide studs, these are little two-ended bolts, into the wide field planetary camera. This is so that uh, uh, this handhold that I'm picking up now, uh, we can then attach it. And we have a little s uh, set of nuts, which we then put on top of those uh, guide bolts, or guide studs, as we call them. So we take the handhold up, we install it uh, onto the width pick. You can see Story free-floating over at the right. He's going to get into the foot restraint right below him. Um, I'm undoing the bolts here that hold the width pick in, and then the two of us working together actually pull the width pick one out from the telescope. And it slides out on some tracks, and it just came out uh, really beautifully. Claude uh, doing the driving on the arm. Uh, Claude did this so beautifully, I, you know, it was hardly necessary <coughs> to say what you wanted to do. He almost anticipated uh, where we needed to be. Uh, both Claude and Sox did an incredible job driving the arm. Uh, we stowed the uh, whiff pick one on the side of the uh, shuttle in a temporary stowage bracket there, and then uh, extracted the uh, whiff pick number two. And remember, this is about four times real speed. We were doing this very slowly. Um, so slowly that you probably wouldn't want to watch the whole thing uh, in real time. But it came out with, without a hitch, and then the uh, delicate process of inserting it in, again with uh, me on one side and Story on the other side, went very well, just, just beautifully. This was a was very finely designed instrument uh, for EVA repair and, and handling. It's a, a good example of what you can do when you design something right.
the story was around back in the Apollo days, and he had commented that nobody had ever uh, taken a Hasselblad into space since Apollo. And so he arranged to uh, have this reactivated, and there I am using it. Uh, and it, it, we got some fabulous pictures uh, with that. Here we are putting on the, the magnetometer. It's a, it's a unit which we basically put on top of the old magnetometers, so we never remove the old ones, and then we, uh, we screw it in, into place. Um, and we're 50 feet above the uh, payload bay, and uh, so not only was it uh, quite a view looking towards the Earth, but <coughs> looking down towards the shuttle was pretty spectacular. EVA day four, uh, as we mentioned, the uh, swap out uh, the new COSTAR instrument for the uh, HST, <coughs> opening the doors there, getting into the bay, and then it got dark fairly quickly, so we did the uh, HST removal uh, in the dark, and you can see the searchlight uh, providing extra light for us there. KT then took the uh, HST uh, down and stowed it on a temporary fixture over on uh, the port side. Then came and, and pulled out the new CoStar unit from its stowage container. Brought it up and then uh, held it here and then pointed the corner down toward me as I came around to remove the DOB or deployable optical bench protective cover. <coughs> all those little mirrors and uh, co-star are right in that corner and they're retracted down inside there. And then those were deployed several inches up out of the co-star uh, several days uh, after we had come home. Getting ready to uh, put co-star in again, we spent quite a bit of time making sure it's perfectly lined up. And again, with only about an inch of clearance, KT did a super job of uh, giving me millimeters of control when I asked for it, uh, guiding it in. And she might want to say something about how it felt. Uh, it was very easy to move, but it was uh, all I could see in front of my face was a box. So Tom was my eyes to put it in that little hole. This is uh, <coughs> getting the new coprocessor uh, out. And then we did a swap out <coughs> on the end of the arm. And I got on the end of the arm and KT uh, behind me there to uh, manage tools and the, the coprocessor. Went up uh, using the power tool, as you <coughs> noticed here. Uh, all the bolts that we had to uh, do except those uh, uh, solar array connector bolts, we used a power tool on, and our tools really held up well and served us well during the mission. Coming back in, this is a good shot of coming back in the airlock. Again, this is four or five times actual speed, I think. You have to be really careful uh, coming into the airlock. <coughs> it's got a fragile uh, covering on it. Going out at the end of every day, we had to uh, untether the MFR or manipulator foot restraint, so if we had to get rid of it overnight, it would come loose from the arm. See all the tools hanging off of each of us as we come in. You had to be very careful coming inside. And then again, at the, the end of each EVA, uh, getting uh, out of suits, reconfiguring tools uh, and suits, changing out batteries uh, <coughs> for the next day. Shows uh, Covey, Claude, and Sox configuring MLI for the covers that we were going to put on the uh, magnetometers on the last EVA, EVA day number five. And here's EVA day number uh, five. I was on the MFR day five, and the other two days that Jeff and I were out, uh, Jeff was on the MFR, so we took turns at that. Here's Jeff is getting the, uh, the GHRS, the Goddard High Rate uh, Spectrometer uh, Repair Kit. Out here's myself uh, and Jeff working on a Sadie, the solar ray drive electronics, changing that out. Uh, there's not much to look at here. It's just very hand intensive work uh, doing mostly electro ceramic connectors <coughs> uh, for about three hours. This is one of the more spectacular views up on top here, looking straight down to Earth 370 miles. We're getting ready to do uh, put the covers, those MLI covers that we had constructed on top of the uh, magnetometers. Here's deployment of the main solar array boom. It just took a couple ounces to get it started down, but the motors were unable to deploy that. So Jeff and I, just with a couple ounces on a wrench, were able to deploy the uh, what's called the primary drive mechanism, but it's really just the solar array boom. Here's deployment of the, the new solar arrays, the blankets 
which will go out there and convert uh, solar energy into electrical energy. But this is the, the final completion, really, of uh, the EVA here. They were able to deploy these while we were still out and also be able to deploy the high-gain uh, antennas and all these things. It was great to get these things done because they did have EVA backups in case any of these mechanisms uh, did not work. Here we are coming inside uh, after the, the final EVA, EVA day number five, and uh, we never really did let our hair down until uh, this final this final day here. We breathed a slight <laughs> sigh of relief on each day when we because we got each day's job done. But I'll tell you, we've been working at this for years, uh, incredible attention to detail, and we did have a moment of jubilation uh, here, although, of course, we had many weeks to wait to see that Hubble really did work. Uh, this is flight day nine, the release day. Uh, you saw the telescope in the back of the bay ready for release. First, uh, we had to capture the telescope uh, using the arm. You see here the final approach uh, to the grapple fiction of the telescope. Then we released the latches on the flight service structure, lifted Hubble over the flight service structure over the cargo bay. And here you can see the release of the telescope. The arm is uh, being pulled away. And the uh, SOX is at the controls of the orbiter for the separation maneuver. Yeah, after Claude released the telescope, uh, I fired a few pulses to get us back in the way. And the telescope slowly started drifting. Uh, once it was at a safe distance, we put some cameras up in the window, and I hope we got some good photos, especially with the IMAX camera. And that's what it looked like, a pretty majestic sight with that big telescope and its brand new solar arrays drifting away. We got lots of film, and uh, we can't wait to, to see it. Uh, I think we're making an advanced screening here on Thursday or Friday of some of our IMAX footage. Well, after uh, deploy, uh, we did, as, as uh, Sox talked about earlier, had a day off. I uh, showed some of the activities uh, on our light day and actually on every day, reading the mail that we'd get up on our, uh, through our computers. Uh, Here's uh, Sox uh, doing some uh, trash compaction and uh, management. And KT's taking care of the laundry. And um, we also, uh, on the day before entry, uh, uh, practiced uh, uh, landing with our new uh, pilot simulator. It's a little onboard uh, uh, computer simulation of the landing task, and it proved uh, extremely useful to us uh, for uh, getting ready for landing. We had uh, great passes over North America and Europe, and uh, this is a pass over um, the Mediterranean Sea, or south of the Mediterranean Sea. You can <coughs> see Sicily and uh, the southern tip of Italy. Uh, we just uh, could uh, see Rome, which is up here on the left-hand side, and Brindisi on the right-hand side. And a little later, we had passes over the delta of the Nile, and you can see Cairo in the middle and uh, a little further north, uh, the lights of Tel Aviv and uh, the west coast. And here's the west coast of the U.S. as we complete our trip around the world. You can see San Francisco Bay up in the center, Los Angeles down at the bottom, uh, Las Vegas coming into view. Las Vegas is outrageously bright. <laughs> uh, you could see the strip from 350 miles. This is Houston. Take a look in the upper left corner and you'll see a very bright fireball meteor come through the atmosphere. Uh, there, you, there it is. Uh, and you can also see Dallas and San Antonio. This is looking up the east coast. You can see lightning storms. You can see a little bit of aurora up there. Looking back towards the west now over Florida. You can see all the way back to uh, Houston. We had a lot of long hours and intense days, and when Covey said it was time to go to bed, it was time to go to bed. And he covered the windows and sent the kids down to the mid-deck. Uh, with five of us sleeping down there, it was pretty cozy. You knew if you moved, you were waking somebody else up. So we managed to all find a place to strap our sleeping bags <coughs> and set story to the airlock. And that on our get ready to come home day, well, this is flight control checkout. And we're making sure all the orbiter systems are working. We brought home everything that we had intended to bring home with the exception of that one solar array. And the solar array carrier looks like a tool board in your garage with one tool missing. So we call that our dead tool silhouette. This is uh, HST. It continued to stay with us through the rest of the flight, and we called it our morning star because we would see it every morning when the sun was reflecting off of it. 
All missions have to end. They end with a deorbit and a landing, hopefully. And uh, this shows us uh, getting ready for uh, for a deorbit. And then uh, the infrared pictures uh, uh, from KSC and uh, Cape Canaveral uh, Air Force Station of our uh, of our turn around to hack and, and approach to uh, runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center. And like I said before, there's nothing like bringing a space shuttle back to uh, the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, we had a, an extraordinary night to fly across Florida uh, with the lights and, uh, and to make this uh, landing um, onto, onto runway 33. The orbiter flies uh, exceptionally well for a, uh, a big glider, uh, and uh, we felt uh, very good about uh, safely rolling out to a stop and bringing STS-61, the servicing and repair mission, to a conclusion.